It costs hundreds of billions of dollars each year and leads to deadly chronic diseases. Who's to blame for the United States' obesity epidemic? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. In the next 18 years, the number of obese people in the U.S. is expected to rise to 42% of the adult population. That means about 32 million more Americans will become obese by 2030 compared to current levels. The latest projection released this week by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also says that 11% will be severely obese. That's at least 45 kilograms overweight. It's a public health epidemic that's costing nearly $150 billion in health care every year. And according to the National Institute of Health, being overweight and obese is the second leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. So who's to blame? On Tuesday, the Institute of Medicine released a report that rejects the idea that obesity is largely the result of a lack of willpower or personal responsibility. The report recommends a pivotal role for schools in obesity prevention. It wants schools to ensure quality physical activity and awareness of nutritional standards among children. The panel says taxing sugar-sweetened beverages should be an option, noting that their link to obesity is stronger than that of any other food or beverage. The report also calls for doctors to play a more aggressive role, and employers have been urged to promote healthy eating and offer obesity-related health coverage. So do the Institute of Medicine's recommendations go far enough? And is it time, in fact, to re-examine the entire framework when dealing with the issue of obesity? To discuss this, we're joined from San Francisco by Michelle Simon. She's the author of Appetite for Profit, How the Food Industry Undermines Our Health and How to Fight Back. Here in the studio, we're joined by Balin Linekin. He's executive director of the Keep Food Legal, organization that advocates against government food regulation, and by Barbara Moore, the president of Shape Up America, a national campaign to raise awareness of obesity as a health issue. Michelle Simon, we have this report now. Um, I, I suppose it's being presented in some ways as a, as a radical departure. This isn't about personal choice. This is about a range of issues uh, that need to be addressed. If we're seriously talking about obesity, that's the sort of thing you've been arguing about for years. So does this, does this make you happy? Are we going in the right direction? Well, I'm afraid not so much because really we've had these sorts of reports for years and it's getting a little tiring for those of us who've been talking about these issues for all these years to just see another report come out to make very similar recommendations that have been made over and over and over. And it's really time that we stop putting out 400 page reports with all these recommendations and get to work and fix this problem. Well, I mean, this must be, I mean, this, is, this really is the week for 400-page reports and, and big campaigns. There is a campaign underway called Weight of a Nation, which began this week, which is the Institute of Medicine and the CDC and, in fact, HBO, the cable company, who are also having a little mini-series about obesity. Let's, let's give you a taste, first of all, then, of, of the way that they're framing the discussion. I'm five foot 10 and 242 pounds. I always say this is the biggest I'm ever gonna be, and I said that like 20 pounds ago. A third of Americans are obese, another third is overweight. Obesity is the biggest threat to the health, welfare, and future of this country. I've always been overweight. I've got diabetes. Sleep apnea, heart disease. Everything's hurting now. It's a lot easier to lose weight than it is to keep weight off. This is probably going to be the first generation of children who are going to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. 18% of our children right now are obese. It's not only health, it's about survival and well-being of the United States as a nation. You don't crave broccoli, and our generation has grown up craving a Big Mac. So, Michelle Simon, what's wrong with that then? I mean, this, clearly this is being presented as a, a, a rallying call and it's time to change things. Isn't that what you want? What's wrong with presenting this debate in these terms? Everything is wrong. That trailer just gives me chills because what it does is point the finger at fat people and it makes them out to be 
wrong and the, to blame, right? That's what's going on. By focusing on obesity, we're blaming fat people for a food environment that is not their fault, that is the fault of the corporate control of the food supply, that is the fault of government policies. And we really need to stop this blaming and shaming and making fat people out to be the, the victims here when really the problem is society and the corporate control of the food supply and government policy. And that's where I want to have this discussion. Barbara Moore, would you, would you accept that? I mean, even in some ways, Shape Up America, your, your group, there is that implication perhaps that you are talking to those who are overweight as well as perhaps corporate America and others. I mean, is, is there that, that implicit blame in, in some of the discussion here, which isn't terribly helpful, which perhaps even misses the point entirely? Well, certainly there's nothing to be gained from blaming obese people for their problem. And uh, we assiduously avoid trying to do that. I mean, that's something to be avoided at all costs. But, um, and I, I suspect I can agree with some of uh, Michelle's point of view about the food industry, but the fact is that obesity is caused by a perfect storm of a multiplicity of factors, and no one factor is going to be entirely responsible for this problem. And if you fix that one factor, you'll be disappointed that the problem hasn't gone away. So you do accept then that personal choice and responsibility does play a part, but it's part of many other factors. That's that right. Way. And Michelle, what, what, again, what's wrong with that then, that, that, that there are a multiplicity of factors here, so, and one of them is personal responsibility? Well, I would kind of switch that around to say obesity is just one symptom of this much larger problem around our food system. And if you just focus on obesity, you'll be disappointed that we haven't fixed this larger problem. So by worrying about obesity, we're replacing full calorie Coca-Cola with diet soda in schools, which we really have no evidence is any better for kids' health than regular soda. We're not addressing the environmental disaster that is caused by factory farms, the meat supply, et cetera. And you know, I could go on and on and name all the symptoms that have to do with corporations and how they put profits ahead of people, not to mention animals, the environment, et cetera. So to me, focusing on obesity is just way too narrow. Leila Linnikin, I mean, you want to get uh, all kind of government out of this? You have a sort of libertarian... Perhaps you can explain your view in all this, actually. Um, I mean, I, I'm not an anarchist, so I don't want government to <laughs> not uh, exist or not to play a role in food. I think there's a, it has a role, for example, a legitimate one in food safety. And I think that, I mean, echoing Michelle's point, um, uh, we may disagree about some things, but we do agree that government has certainly played a role in causing the problem of obesity today. We may disagree about exactly what, but, for example, subsidies. Um, are a huge problem. That's that's one example. You know, I was at the um, the, the DC premiere of that HBO film uh, a week or two ago, and I don't know if you were too. Um, no. And I was really struck by certainly we all see I think the same problem. I mean, we all think that obesity is a is a, a serious problem. I, I don't think you know we would dispute that. Michelle sees it as I think she just said uh, part of a larger issue, and you may you may as well. And I mean, I think that. Uh, the way that government has skewed our choices uh, for, say, corn and soy and sugar by subsidizing those things in favor of other things that may be healthier, um, certainly those things can yeah, but, that, that shows the power of government. And if we, do, if we are facing an emergency, then doesn't that mean that the government still has to have a role in skewing it back perhaps to a more sensible policy? Though? Possibly. Well, this is uh, Mark Bittman, uh, has a, who's the New York Times uh, food policy writer. Um, has a, an approach where uh, you know the government shouldn't subsidize things he doesn't like; they should subsidize things he likes. And uh, there, a critic of his uh, referred to this as "let's subsidize things I like" mentality. Um, it's it, government shouldn't play a role in picking winners and losers. It should allow us to eat the foods we want to. And right now, it's it's really just skewing things toward. Right. Well, I feel we jumped ahead a bit. Let's get let's start at the beginning then, as, as to the government framework of all this. Key to this is um, this idea of energy balance as the model through which the government looks at what's healthy, what's not, and how we discuss obesity. That weight is simply about calories in, calories out, calories expended, and calories there that we take in. Now, a lot of research now is questioning some of the assumptions behind that. Um, uh, is that, is that the useful st starting point, perhaps, Barbara Moore? The, the, the fact is that energy balance is fundamental to this issue. So yes, calories in and calories out and the balance between the two is going to dictate whether you gain weight, lose weight, or maintain your current weight. However, and, and what people are trying to argue now is that there are differences between carbohydrate calories, fat calories, and protein calories. 
And I would argue that the evidence that there are um, big differences in the ways in which these calories are metabolized, these diff three different types of calories are metabolized, is so trivially small and so insignificant with regard to this problem that it's not even worth discussing. Michelle Simon, would you agree with that? Well, I, you know, I don't really want to get into a debate about calories in, calories out again. I just isn't isn't that fundamental to how we understand how this, why this is happening? At least, at least it's one of those factors. And it's, it's one of the starting factors. We'll get on to some of the other factors in a moment. But, but is it as simple as, as, you know, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie? Well, no, because a broccoli calorie is not the same as a cheeseburger calorie. I mean, it's about quality of food as much as it is about quantity. And that's why, you know, this obsession with calories tends to miss the quality issue. And, well, perhaps you know, then you can, anyway, you can perhaps then link that up then to agricultural subsidies, which have already been mentioned then. So how does that quality of calorie link up to an agricultural subsidy that's decided upon here in Washington? All right. Well, Balin's absolutely right. We have this twisted system of agricultural subsidies that focuses on mainly commodities, soy and corn and wheat are, and are the building blocks of our animal product center diet and uh, processed food diet. So it sounds strange, right? Corn and soy, what could be wrong with that? Well, actually, those commodities go mostly to feed animals on factory farm. And that's what makes meat products so cheap. Right, because the um, big agribusiness players are, are have these commodities subsidized, and then it gets fed to animals, and that's what keeps this engine of highly processed animal products going uh, in the American diet, and, and it also keeps the horror of factory farm going. So we are subsidizing America's animal product centered diet and that is leading to chronic illness. But then, so then we have to link in the science. This is why it gets, there's so many layers to this. So this links into the science though, for example, high fructose corn syrup, which is as a part of this then, I mean, perhaps you can explain it better. It becomes much cheaper than, than raw cane sugar, for example, and that's then what, what, what food but manufacturers decide to show. The, the distinction between s table sugar, sucrose, and, and high fructose corn syrup is not worth discussing. In but other are, words, are there new st studies which show that rats, for example, have more and, and bigger fat cells because they're, they're eating high fructose corn syrup rather than, 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 than no. normal sugar? I mean, no, there aren't studies that show that. There are studies that show that they are metabolized slightly differently, but in the larger scheme of things, when it, it's trying to explain a 300 pound weight gain, it's not important. Now, it may be important that they're choosing to drink um, uh, soda, sugar sweetened beverages every single day, maybe even six or seven cans of, of, of sugar sweetened beverages. And it's possible that Michelle's right, that there's no perception that, that this might be dangerous. And it is true that it can be cheaper to buy soda than it can to buy plain water. And why, by the way, isn't water just available everywhere? It's ubiquitous and free and clean and potable. So, I mean, there are lots and lots of issues here besides the food industry. There's what are, what's going on in schools. Why is our environment totally dominated by the automobile? Why is it our communities don't even, uh, aren't designed anymore to support walking and uh, and right, so and this is bicycling. very much what, what the Institute of Medicine was sort of saying. M Michelle, I, I guess I mean, what I'm trying to get is, can you just clearly say why, you know, that's all very well-meaning, I suppose, but why that's still sort of missing the point? What What is the point here? Well, the point is that we need to help people make healthier choices who want to do so. And I'm you know, not saying we need to force people into healthier choices, but right now we have a social justice problem on our hands. And whether it's thinking about food or access to um, walking trails and bike trails, which I agree are important, don't really have enough or hardly anything to do with obesity. Just as a side note, exercise is much less important when it comes to talking about obesity than food intake. But exercise is extremely important for overall health. And it is true that your health depends on where you live. And we do need to provide better access to being able to engage in physical activity and, more importantly, access fresh fruits, truly healthy food, affordable food. So the conversation should be about why we have a disparity in this country where people who live in my neighborhood have access to fresh food, and people who live a, a mile or two from me do not.
Bailin Ninnikin, that you reject some of some of these the premises of this argument. Uh, I mean, this is the food desert argument, I guess. And there's been, I think, two studies within the last, I would say, two weeks and another a uh, few months ago that have rejected the idea that urban food deserts uh, play a, a link that have a link to obesity and play a role in the obesity problem in America. Um, I mean, I, I think there are legitimate studies. They just came out, uh, and so there's, there hasn't been sort of follow-up so to It's sort of based on satellite ma maps and so forth, trying to see whether um, right. deprived areas have right, food. But, but isn't it more about the variety right. within those shops, though, food? That, isn't, isn't that where these satellite maps don't really perhaps tell the whole story? Yeah, I mean, you can look at, there's a neighborhood near, near the Minnesota Ave uh, metro stop here in D.C., where that, that's in the middle of a food desert. It's surrounded by food deserts. But if you look in the D.C. government's own website, you can see that they list several groceries around there that have won awards for healthy food choices. So it's, it's sort of paradoxical that that is a food desert. But again, Michelle, just to go back to this idea of obesogens, it's a term that I hadn't really come across before, but I mean, this idea that there are actual, it's not simply um, just uh, say, and, I, I, and apparently, Barbara, you don't accept this, but that, that say, for example, high fructose syrup for fructose might be an obesogen. It might might contribute to obesity because of the way that it affects, right. you know, insulin this or whatever. This is sort of going whatever. for the capillary. You know what right. I mean? Instead of the jugular. In other words, in other words, people are f are sort of honing in on these little teeny differences, metabolic differences between this nutrient and that nutrient. I mean, the kinds of discussion that I think Michelle is advocating for look at much larger economic But, but amongst those factors. obesogens that aren't simply about food additives, but about environmental issues that we don't know very much about in the first That's place. That's true. Kind of what goes into the packaging, what goes into the pesticides, what goes into all these other things, which again, uh, Michelle exactly. Simon, perhaps you can help us understand there's more and more studies suggesting that they have perhaps a, a huge role, more, if, if, you know, than perhaps the simple idea that, you know, you are what you eat uh, in the sense of, you, you know, you're as many calories as you eat in and you expand. Help us understand that. Right. Well, this is an untapped area, and it's just starting it's to be explored and just starting to come out. In other words, what you're saying, that there are environmental factors within our diet, in other words, chemicals in a food supply that may have certain, um, I don't really like the word obesogenic, but could contribute to obesity in ways that we haven't thought about that are way more complex than just eating more calories. And you know, the point is we can't just be taking a simplistic approach like, oh, well, does a neighborhood have not enough supermarket? Is that related to obesity? <laughs> That's not the issue. The issue is access to food, this complex array of chemicals that is in our food supply that people don't even know what they're eating, and getting back to just the basics of eating real food and making sure real food is readily available to people. Because if you walk into a supermarket, most of what's in there is not even real food. Right, so what's going so wrong then? How, why, aren't, why, is the, why are we in this state then, Michelle? Well, because we have turned a fundamental human need, food, over to corporate profit making. Okay? And if you think about our system of capitalism, food to a capitalist is no different than clothing or furniture or anything else that they sell. But for the human condition, food is pretty basic, just like water or air. And yet, we've turned it into a commodity like anything else. And corporations don't care what they're selling. They just need to sell more of it. They need to sell it as efficiently as possible. And that's at the heart of what's going on. It is true that, that the United States formulates dietary guidelines every five years and they, and we would, nutritionists would like people to eat according to the dietary guidelines because... Well, those they, dietary guidelines have been questioned repeatedly as well. In, much, so. in my opinion, they represent consensus of, of science that, about what constitutes um, healthy eating. But if all Americans ate according to the dietary guidelines, we wouldn't be able to produce enough fruits and vegetables for them to do that. there's no discussion about this. I mean, you, you said that it was speculative to talk about... Um, Obesogenic. You know, uh, about obesogens and, and environmental, you know, PCBs being in our food, BPA, the lining of the containers and stuff like that. But isn't that what the food industry is relying upon, that they're able to fund any study that they want, which says one thing. I mean, there's a reluctance, perhaps, to study some of this stuff you know, in, the, in the first place because they're so powerful. Actually... It might I not be a bad idea to look, at, to, to look at the, the power of the, the food lobbies 
Uh, Reuters did an amazing um, report on lobbying by the U.S. food industry, specifically actually um, under the Obama administration, and it's really gone into high gear. The food and beverage industry is worth about $1.5 trillion annually, and it spent $175 million on lobbying since Barack Obama took office. In 2009, the industry spent $40 million fighting a congressional proposal to level a penny an ounce tax on sugary drinks, and that measure subsequently died in committee. Industry lobbyists defeated similar beverage tax plans in 23 states and five cities. In 2011, Congress attempted the first school menu overhaul in 15 years. Industry groups quickly got involved. They gave nearly a million dollars to fight the changes. And now, although white bread and whole milk are no longer part of school lunches, french fries remain. And tomato sauce, famously on pizza, was counted as, as, as a, a vegetable. vegetable. I mean, so, I mean, you seem, I mean, you say that you have confidence in the consensus when it comes down to the sort of regulations that we're getting from no, no, government. No, no, no. But actually, I said I believe in the consensus science regarding undergirding the dietary guidelines. But I, I think that you raise some important points about the size of the food industry compared to, let's say, the size of the tobacco industry. I mean, the tobacco industry is minuscule compared to the food industry. But they're very similar tactics, though, perhaps. Right? And interestingly, they do employ some similar tactics. And and you're right, they do have, um, they do finance some of the research that gets gets done. And obviously, so, so they can always say that there's no necessarily there's not necessarily proof between marketing sugary drinks to school children and obesity. There's no proof that um, subsidies to agri farmers lead to people eating more sugar and then becoming obese or eating more high fructose and so forth. I mean, are those the kind of gray areas, Bailey and Linekin, that, that actually the food industry are taking advantage of? I mean, it's not a gray area when there's just no evidence to support the, the argument. It's, uh, you know, oh, does marketing to kids increase the amount of sugary soda? And, and Michelle's going to erupt at some point. But um, there's no evidence. I mean, parents and make these that. decisions I mean, and should make these decisions. This is, this is why we have parents. But to assert that the food industry is spending something like $11 billion a year to make us buy this product versus that one because it doesn't work is ridiculous. I mean, it clearly works. And no. there is marketing Which, to children under the age of 12 that is unprecedented. And it, yes, it does influence their food choices. And I would argue it obviously influences their their food intake, not just their choices, but what they're actually eating. I guess, eating. Michelle, Simon, what one's worried about is more than just simply marketing, which clearly does, which many, and certainly anecdotally at the very least, would seem to have some, some linkage. It's actually about uh, when it comes to regulation, this idea that, that self-regulation will be enough, that we don't even need to look at things like so-called obesogens and environmental factors and so forth. I mean, how successful are they being, as far as that's concerned, behind the scenes? And what can be done about that, do you think? Right. Well, I think if we were to start anywhere, we should start with marketing to children. And this, to me, is a no-brainer. And we don't need proof that marketing to children works. As obviously, they wouldn't be spending all that money on it if they didn't think it worked. And it's not even about how much you know, kids eat and how that relates to obesity. Marketing to children is simply morally wrong for this reason. Children cannot understand what advertising is. They can understand what's called persuasive, persuasive intent, which is the linchpin of advertising. Right? Adults at least have some ability, although we're not so good at it either, to deflect advertising messages. Children are by nature vulnerable and open to emotional messages. And that's exactly what the food industry is preying upon. They are taking advantage of children's vulnerabilities. Brian Lillian, doesn't so that remind me, you of big to tobacco when, when, they, when they would deny, well, there's any link between you know, tobacco and cancer? And the more they said it, the more people, you know, legislators would say, well, we can't, we can't, we can't legislate about uh, that then. I mean, this idea that marketing doesn't have any effect on children, doesn't that seem a bit? I wouldn't well, say that it has no effect, science. but I would say that, A, kids don't have money. You know, and if they have money, they have, they have $100 money. $100 a week on average. Then That's why what they have. White parents. kids, black they're, kids, they're, and Hispanic kids have $100 a which week is to great. spend. great. We live in an affluent society where parents give kids money. That buys you a lot of Big Macs. That's really the parents' decision to give the kids money. I mean, if, if parents are responsible for anything, it's sheltering their kids, it's feeding their kids, it's housing their kids, it's loving their kids. And it's giving advice to their this kids. This is a country that's fairly hostile toward parents. It's fairly hostile towards families. And it, despite the fact that family values are touted all the time, I, I, I find it really quite remarkable that, um, that we have a culture now where um, 
parents and families are not particularly well supported from a cultural Michelle standpoint. Michelle Simon, I mean, your, your book title talks about how to fight back and so forth. We've only got 10 seconds, but what, what, is the, what is the simple in a nutshell answer then to all this, do you think? I would say to get engaged politically, that is the bottom line, that we need to create a political movement in this country, that politicians need to be held accountable, they need to speak for the people, they need to help parents do their jobs, and we need to get political. Michelle Simon, thank you very much. Bailey Linnikan, thank you. Thank you. Barbara Moore, thank you too. Thank you. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. We want to hear from you as well. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net.